Indigenous Voices, a podcast that highlights the perspective of indigenous peoples of the world. Welcome to the second episode of Indigenous Voices, a podcast produced by the FSC Indigenous Foundation. On this occasion, we will be talking about the relationship between indigenous peoples and the environment. Today, we are joined by Tenaje Wanikau. Tenaje Wanikau is a member of the Maori people of New Zealand and alternate member of the FSC Permanent Indigenous Peoples Committee. Tenaje, it's an honor to share this space with you. As a first question, uh, we would like to ask you, would you like to start talking about the relationship of reciprocity that indigenous peoples maintain with nature, from which they take what they need without altering the natural equilibrium? In the case of your people, the Maori, how does this relationship work? Yahu mai tēnei i runga i taho mata o pōpui ana mai nō te tihi o tongariro. Maunga tapu, pautoko manawa. The words I deliver are born upon the chill winds that blow forth from the summits of our sacred mountain, tongariro. Upon them are the memories of our ancestors and our connections to all, thing within the, all things within the environment and the universe. My tribe is Ngāti Tuwharetō, and we occupy the central mountain areas of the North Island of New Zealand, or Aotearoa, as we call it. Our relationship with the environment for Māori, for the tribes of Māori, I can only speak for my tribe, but we are all the same. Our relationship encompasses every single thing within the environment. It is a relationship whereby we cherish, we conserve, and we sustain all things within our world. This encompasses the soil, the rocks, the plants, the animals, the people that inhabit the land, the waterways, everything in existence. Our word for this in Māori, and it's very hard to translate into English, is manaki. To manaki a person or to manaki the land is to give yourself, to give of yourself in a reciprocal manner. To care for the land means the land will care for you. All relationships are reciprocal. If you care for people, people will care for you. Māori are, are very... <clears throat> Māori have always had deep respect for all things around us. We are a, a warrior culture. But we are also a culture of deep of deep knowledge that has been handed down from generation to generation. Māori did not embrace Christianity. Māori did not forsake who and what we were when Christianity first arrived in Aotearoa. We saw Christianity as something that was trying to erase our connection and our belief systems, our, our mouldiness. And I know this doesn't sound like it's answering your question, but to answer your question, I've got to tell you why. For us to be able to practice a methodology of reciprocal nurturing and caring for things around us. We found it difficult to find that in concepts such as Christianity 
which for us were concepts based on, at that time, conquest, assimilation, colonisation, and and demeaning Indigenous peoples and their cultures. Christianity was part of what was destroying our world in our eyes. Because behind, within Christianity were things like what we now call today capitalism, extractivism, where people would either come with war and Māori fought the wars with the British. We fought the wars at times with the missionaries. So for us, our connection to the world comes from the creation story that Māori carry. Our creation story is a connection to every single thing within this universe, to you and I, to the land. Our gods created were, became guardians of different aspects of the environment. Some were the waterways, some were the forests, some was the land. When mankind was born from the gods, that responsibility was given to us to hold precious the things that had been handed down. If we did not look after them and cherish them, we would be destroying ourselves in the process. So we... We sustained the thing that sustained us. And I often look at Western, Western paradigms where they seem to me like they are sitting on a branch of a tree, but they are cutting off the branch they sit on because um, their, their whole philosophy is based on take. So the biggest threat to Māori was the attempted introduction of Christianity. And I'm speaking to you in English. The languages that have colonised the world are English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and other languages from Europe, but in the main, those languages. So for us to even communicate with other indigenous people, we communicate in the language of the culture that tried to assimilate and conquer us. There's an irony in that. So for Māori, the word manaki means to give. Manaki tangata means that um, the closest English word is hospitality, but that's, it's more than hospitality. It's to give without question, to embrace someone, to honour their culture. If you visited our people, we would learn some of your language so we could speak to you and address you in the manner that was important to you. That's manaki, because you are important enough to care about we have that same attitude to all things within our environment, the water. We will only take what we need and we will ensure that the water that leaves us and goes to someone else downstream is pure water. Because for us, the water came from the womb of Mother Earth. We call the Earth Papatuanuku, which is the mother. That water fell from the skies and it came from the womb. The womb of a woman is life, is potential, is nurturing, is love, is. So wherever that water touches, there is life. Where there is no water, there's no life. That's the connection to the womb of the mother. She brings life. With all the things that grow, the forest, the animals, the yes, we eat, we hunt, 
but we ensure our hunting practices are sustainable and we honour what we hunt. We give respect to what we hunt. So the practice of Māori is one of reciprocal nurturing, reciprocal cherishing, of sustainability, and of a deep spiritual connection to what we believe we have, uh, what's the English word? Family. The, the trees are our family. The world is our family because we are kept connected by a common ancestor, which was the creator. Yeah. Thank you so much for that answer. I really appreciate it. Uh, I think it's very important, all the things that you say about how this connection is more uh, like a family, like just like the, the thing that you say, like a family thing, and also uh, the appreciation that you have for the nature. And I also think that what you have said is connected to the second question that we're going to do. Uh, your answers relate to a connection that goes beyond the physical and presents into the spiritual world this connection that we have with the nature, especially the Maori people. So I would like to ask you, why is it important right now for the whole world to understand this connection and why is so hard for many of us to understand it? Maori live in a spiritual world. When we look at any aspect, when I look at you and I talk to you, all I see above you is your, is your land, your mountains. I see above you two parents, above your two parents, four parents, above your four parents, eight parents. Above the eight, sixteen. This is who you are. Above the sixteen, thirty-two. Maori understand a thing we call whakapapa, which is genealogy. Genealogy is what connects us. I expect every young person before the age of sixteen to know the 34 generations before them when we left an island in Tahiti and came to Aotearoa. We left Tahiti 34 generations ago. I expect every single young person before they're 16 to know that, to know each generation, to know the brothers and sisters. My father could go back 400 generations. In those 400 generations, it connected us to first Chile. And we have a close connection with the Mapuche people. Through South America, through North America, through Asia, the whole journey of our people. So your question Why is it so important to understand this connection? We are, the same, we are the children of the same ancestor. We, we are connected when we go back. We just don't understand it. We have lost our spirituality. The Western world only sees material things. When Māori look at anything, Um, when I speak uh, this morning, the first person I spoke to was Violetta, and I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. When I saw her, my soul and my heart was connecting, not as a picture on Zoom, but as a connection that began in the universe. So, Why is it important? Until we understand our connection and the importance to each other that we all hold. I come from an area of Aotearoa that we have mountains and snow. And I always say to the young, 
English is a bad language. I don't say this, but English is a bad language to express uh, express heart, express Māori is a, easy to express the spiritual, the heart, the things the eye doesn't see, but the heart feels, the spirit connects with. We, we can say it easily. It's very hard in English because that, language, that culture is not made for. So I say to our young in Māori, and this is the best translation I can give, when, when we look at the mountains and the snowfalls, for us to understand the importance of our connection to each other and to the land, the water, we have to understand our own insignificance. So we are only a snowflake. We're insignificant. Without the snowflake, if you take away the snowflake, that means there's no glaciers. There's no mountains covered in snow. That's our significance. And without the glaciers, there's no rivers. There's no water. So from our very insignificance to understand that, then we can understand our significance in this universe. As people, individually, we are insignificant. But as people that come together to change the world and carry a vision, we are very significant. So yes, connection is something that's very important to understand. Our connection to each other, our connection to a, a vision. That only happens through people connecting with each other. We have a saying where I come from, Aho ko te matau, nā te matau ka wiri te kiri, nā te wiri o te kiri, ka piri te tangata, nā te piri o te tangata, ka ora ai tātou. It is from the chill wind, that cold wind, and we all know it somewhere. There's a cold wind and we know, oh, no, no more summer, it's winter time. When that cold wind hits us, it causes our skin to shiver. That's, that's, that's what happens to the world. The cold wind is now COVID. The cold wind is poverty. The cold wind is war. It causes us to shiver. From us shivering, people come together, connection. And from people coming together, we will find a way forward, but it needs people. To believe people are powerful. So yes, the connection is important. Thank you so much. Yeah, I just take what you say about how this is not only important for the connection with the nature, and also because it's kind of like a bridge to connect with other people, with the genealogy. So I think it's, it's very beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, also, we would like to ask you if you could tell us that even though indigenous people face threats like extractivism, racism, and the alienation of their cultures, how they have been able to preserve the environment through time? Māori have many proverbs. One of the proverbs that Māori have is, learn the ways of the West. Learn Western culture, but never learn Western culture at the sacrifice of who you are. Never lose that you are Māori. And I think this is for all Indigenous peoples. Māori in our history our history first through many years of very, the British, which we enjoyed. <laughs> uh, many years of fighting political battles. It's because 
we never believed it would be better to be someone else than Māori. We never believed the Western system was ever superior to ours. We never, ever believed. So we believe the Western system to be something that's good for your hands. There's, a, there's a, another proverb. <laughs> Learn the ways of the West. Heoranga motoringa for your hand. That, that's good for your hands. Never sacrifice your Māori, your language, your culture, because that's well-being for your heart and soul. Do what you have to for your hands. Be a lawyer. If we need a lawyer, be a lawyer. But be a, be a lawyer that has a Māori mind, a Māori heart, and a Māori soul. So being a lawyer just becomes a tool. And that's how Māori looked at the Western world. Sit close to your friends. Sit closer to your enemies. Learn their ways. Learn the language. Learn the... Go to the universities. Re, uh, almost reverse colonisation. Take what we need to succeed in, in their world. But do it for Māori. Yeah. Don't get lost in their world. And we never get lost. <laughs> so Indigenous people sometimes get lost. Sometimes they think the world that they're, in, they're, they're leaving their world to go to a superior world. No. Their world is superior. Yeah. Leave your world. Learn the ways. Learn the languages. Learn the um, learn their scholarship. Learn their knowledge. But use it. They are only tools to them that will that work for us as Maori. So we don't have to buy a lawyer. We've got one. We don't have <laughs> we don't have to buy a doctor. We've got one. But that person is Māori, not just in skin, not just in looks, in heart. They're still Māori. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it, it is. Thank you so much. I think that the key here is also this problem that sometimes people face about their identity. But I think it's really beautiful that Māori people has this this on their heart, like the true key is to have your identity first and then whatever you want to do in life and also to help your people. Also about the connection that we were talking about, uh, the nature, we continuously hear about sustainable development, but sometimes it can be heard as shallow, particularly from the vision of indigenous peoples what does this concept mean to you and to Maori people? I believe some of in, in some of the statement that was in your question. I've seen models of indigenous cons conservation that really just have indigenous faces, but the model is actually a Western model. Maori business in Aotearoa. Um, have proved that Māori uh, tikanga, which is our value system, and <coughs> and our concept of manaki whenua, which means to nurture, protect, and cherish the environment, is something that improves your business model. It is not something that's the antithesis of good business. It is actually good business. An example. 
We have hundreds and thousands of hectares in exotic forest. It's one of our businesses. Within that exotic forest, uh, we grow a Canadian tree called Pinus uh, radiata. It takes 100 years to grow in Canada, and it takes 30 years to grow in Aotearoa, in New Zealand. And they asked, why are Māori growing trees from Canada? We grow trees from Canada on land that had no forest. And we grow trees from Canada so we do not cut our own trees, our native, for our indigenous forests are untouched. We treat the trees from Canada like a crop of corn. And we cut them in such a manner that it employs our people, but we, because it takes 30 years for the trees to cut, we can employ our people for 30 years cycle before, before the, all the trees are cut. It takes them 30 years to go round, and when they come back, the first trees that we grow are, are, are grown again, so that it's sustainable. Within our forests, our um, exotic forests, one third of our exotic forests are still, all the waterways are still natural corridors of indigenous forest. So that our animals and birds can still move within this forest. So we employ our own people. We ensure that the cycle, we do not cut so fast that that it takes more than 30 years to do the whole cycle. When they do one cycle, they come back and those trees are ready to cut from 30 years ago. So it keeps going round, keeps our, 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 at least 800 of our people employed. They are our forests um, and it stops us. Um, we are not cutting our indigenous forests. Um, and it's we are we have one of the top model um, exotic forests in Asiana, Oceana. We apply that principle to all our businesses. We apply the principle of what we take, we and we will only take enough to ensure that we can keep the business is sustainable. So um, I think indigenous peoples, and indigenous people need to believe in themselves. We need to believe our culture, the culture that's within your lands, within the lands of indigenous people, are cultures that have been developed through a close intimate association with everything in their environment over thousands of years. Not just a few hundred years, thousands of years. So that knowledge is a knowledge that's invaluable to the world. But for that knowledge to be available to the world, we ourselves as Indigenous people have to believe in it. <laughs> and too many instances I see Indigenous people, uh, to have an Indigenous board or an Indigenous governance entity or an Indigenous company that just follows the same Western models, it's not Indigenous it's not an indigenous a um, it is not an indigenous way of doing things. And in many instances we do that. We copy. Just believe in us, believe in ourselves, believe in knowledge that has been handed down for hundreds of generations. 
believe in a connection to all things around you. And yes, we do have something because the world is lost today. Look at the world. We're killing ourselves. And and the worst thing is we know it, (laughs) but we don't know how to stop. And if they would just let indigenous, if first indigenous people believed in themselves, be guided by the indigenous people of any community. Um, some, sometimes it takes. Sometimes the problem is, is ourselves, indigenous people. I think it's very important because uh, we were talking about this connection that. A lot of indigenous communities and also Maori people have with the nature and the respect that they have and you have with the nature cycles. But why is it so hard for the world to reach this kind of connection, to reach this kind of respect and also this sustainable development that uh, we are calling right now, but it has it had also been thousands of years here in, in, in the communities. Why are we going in the opposite direction? I believe it started with the doctrine of discovery in the 1400s when the the Pope at that time. <clears throat> um, I think against the Catholic Church, I, I respect all beliefs. But in the 1400s, the Pope wrote a document called the the doctrine of discovery. That document virtually set, gave the right to all Christians to, to have ownership of all things in the world and all people. From that <clears throat> came a, a system of engagement with indigenous people, and that, that system would start with trade, The first would be trade. That's lovely. Trade's lovely. We might marry, we might, we might have children with one and one of the indigenous ladies. Beautiful. After trade came, um, usually, um, settlements, little settlements. Then after settlements, uh, military and missionaries. And our belief systems got worn down. They got worn down either through military means, through religious means, where we were told that our belief systems were evil. And all all of those things. We, We weren't blameless. We wanted the guns. We wanted, you know, the new technology. But that set a platform for the way in which we then taught our children and their children and their children and their children. It's a very hard thing to reverse. Um, So it is hard to reach. It needs something. The people in power and the UN and the people's and the, uh, the, the permanent Indigenous Peoples Council and all the Indigenous boards, um, they need to write to actually provide a model, a, glo- a model for the globe. At the moment, I'm just talking to you, and I, I enjoy it. But it's our conversation we need to come together and say, look, this is a viable model because the West only understands they can only receive information in certain ways because their whole mind, their whole spirit, their soul, their heart can only understand information and if it's presented in a certain manner. I don't believe we've done that yet. And I believe Indigenous peoples have the power to do that. We... Human beings, you and I and everyone on this 
We're selfish. We think of ourselves. That's the way human beings are. We are always trying to fight thinking of ourselves and thinking of others and the land before ourselves. If it's ingrained in your culture, it's easy. If it's not ingrained in your culture, if your culture teaches you, if I've got, if I have my lunch and I've got five friends that have got no lunch, I eat my lunch. Indigenous people will share their lunch <laughs> because that's how we think. If we've got two sandwiches, we'll make sure that the other ones all get a little bit of that food. The Western culture will say it doesn't matter if they've got no food. I, I'm not going to share my food. I'm going to eat it. We need to show that the other model, there's enough resource in this world to feed the whole world. But why are so many people starving? Uh, we allow corporations to own whole parts of nature, to own seeds, until uh, you, your people in South America, how many seeds came from you? <laughs> the food we eat in Aotearoa, 5,000 miles away across the Pacific, came from you. We eat kumara, sweet potato. We eat potato, it came from you. So why do corporations own this? Where people can't even grow. So yeah, we need a, a global discussion of indigenous people and people that believe. Not, not indigenous people that look indigenous but their heart's not indigenous. <laughs> no. Yeah, and also uh, you have already talked about how we are facing a different kind of crisis every day here and around the world. So in that kind of context, we would like to ask you, we live where we face a health crisis, fragile economies, another challenge. What is the key to achieve successful governance solutions and co-management of natural resources? I can start by telling you the things that are barriers to success. And then I can tell you what may be success models. The first things that we face now as barriers to success is ego people's ego. Greed is a barrier to success. Individualism, power. Power is connected to ego. They are all barriers to success. I, I have seen all these things. I've seen them from people that that say that they are representing indigenous communities. These people are, are invariably driven by something that, uh, by individual, um, driven through individual selfish needs, um, in nearly every case driven by greed, driven by fear sometimes. And the fear is that if they say the wrong thing, they'll be punished. And every, on a very rare occasion, you will see someone that is driven by the truth. And you will know it. You don't need paper. You don't need qualifications. Your soul, your heart will know it. That's what we need to succeed. We need people, men, women, who are strong in their belief, who are strong in understanding who they are, 
their own identity, their culture. If you don't know who you are, how can you engage with the world? We need people that are, that are generous, good hearts. Well, we need saints, <laughs> but we need strong saints, indigenous saints, that will follow something and stand up no matter what the threat to their own personal well-being and sometimes even safety. This is the only thing that transforms the world. When people, the only time the world is transformed is when people have had enough. In Russia, it was the revolution. When people had had enough of uh, the czars um, having all the wealth. Uh, in France, the revolution, people had had enough. In every country, when the people who are most oppressed have had enough through the people, we don't need to change with war. We can change with something more powerful than war. We can change with the message that we believe, not because someone's paying us good money. Money is nothing. I can spend money in the one day. Something that we carry in our soul and our heart. So yes, we need people of integrity and truth and then we will succeed. Yeah, thank you so much. So finally, we would like to ask you if you could give any kind of message to the indigenous peoples and communities that are listening to you right now. Uh, what message will you want to give? To the indigenous people of the world, you are the salvation of this world. The practices that they've been handed down to you from generation to generation from your ancestors, believe in yourself. The world needs our, us, the indigenous people. Now more than ever, the world is very close to a point where it's very hard to turn back. And before the world can listen to us, we must believe in ourselves. So to each of you, every indigenous community, whatever your, whatever continent you belong to, let us stand together as one voice, one people, the people of the land and the people that can save this, save this world. Let us be the, the beacon of hope. Thank you very much, De Nahe, for sharing these few minutes with us and also helping us to understand the relationship between indigenous peoples, not only with the environment, but also with their heart, with their connection with other people around the world. Thank you so much for joining us today. We invite you to listen to the next episode of Indigenous Voices, a podcast that highlights the perspective of indigenous peoples worldwide. Don't miss our next episode. Learn more about the FSC Indigenous Foundation and its work with indigenous peoples around the world through the website www.fscindigenousfoundation.org and its social networks, FSC Indigenous Foundation, in Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. <laughs>